everybody. Another episode of Tattoos, Code, and Data Flows. Really excited for my guest today, Dustin Lair. He's an application security professional, years of experience based out of Colorado. He's got a lot of great things to say about, you know, different aspects of AppSec and very excited to have him. Let's get ready to rumble. Dustin. Very excited to have you on the podcast today. Hope things are going well. Just for the audience, why don't you give a little background on yourself, uh, what you've been up to, what your uh, career background, and you know how you ended up here on the podcast with me. Absolutely. Thanks, Matt, for having me. Um, so my name is Dustin Lair. I uh, actually, my background is mostly in software engineering. So studied computer science uh, and then uh, spent about 13 years actually as a software engineer uh, slash application architect before I uh, kind of took the plunge into security. Um, so uh, really had decided to be, you know, a, a individual contributor uh, the rest of my career actually at the time and got the opportunity to um, lead the application and application security team. Uh, at the time it was my previous company. Uh, so I had to think about it for a while, but eventually <laughs> decided, you know what, let's do it. So, uh, yeah, so uh, currently I'm director of application security for Fivetran, and uh, security field is absolutely fascinating to me. Uh, the reason, a couple of reasons I got into it, uh, one of them being to fix it. So I was kind of on the other side as a software engineer, just looking at the security team, like, what are you doing? You're not helping. You know, what what's that going on? Why are you asking me to do this again? Uh, so that's that's a big part of it, and then. Um, I've always had a focus on quality in general, and I find security to be a great uh, avenue to drive quality across an organization. So I would say that's uh, that's one of the main reasons that I'm so passionate about it. No, that's awesome. And I always say application security is a, a, a term that can be many things to many people. And uh, just the way you interpret it, and uh, I like your approach to, you know, quality, because there always is those intersecting, you know, quality and security are two separate things, but they interact together a lot of times. Like, is it a security bug, or is it a quality bug, or is it both? Absolutely. Yeah. And, I, you know, as I got kind of deeper into software engineering and, and became an architect and stuff, that just became more of the conversation is the security piece. You know, the first step is to build functional software. But if you're, you know, if you're thinking about things beyond that, you're thinking about maintainability and performance and security and 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 building resilient architecture and, and kind of the full picture. And I think that's why I just naturally got into mm -hmm. security. And, and for me, there's a bit of a there was a rabbit hole, right, where you start learning about OWASP and, and all these security concepts. Yeah. And if you're curious, you don't stop. Right. You just keep going. Yeah, I remember reading like cheat sheet after cheat sheet on OWASP. I'm like, oh, cool, you know, just like really getting into it. So, yeah, anyway. Awesome. Well, thank that's great background. So we're going to jump into it with our first section of Thinking Out Loud. I'm thinking out loud, maybe we found love right where we are. So, Dustin, in your day-to-day -day activity as an application security executive, you know, what's keeping you up at night? As we mentioned kind of in the intro, that application security can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. You know, what is your focus on a day-to-day -day basis in today's rapid development in a modern DevOps CICD world? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, there's different levels of maturity, right, that each, that each company has. And when you kind of walk in the door, you have to kind of recognize where you are and, and figure out where you want to go. Um, I think in general, um, there's there's kind of this uh, a, a major two step process in my mind. One of them, the, the very first step being really understanding the environment in general. What's out there? What do you need to protect? Uh, and then what is the current state? You know, so doing things like putting tools in place and and doing pen tests and and really get an understanding of uh, of what you're looking at in terms of maturity. Um, that's a big part of it. The other part of it in my mind is engagement. So now that you know what the environment is like, uh, you're not going to fix everything, right? <laughs> so you do have to engage the folks across the organization to motivate them, you know, figure out how to incentivize them uh, to actually take action against those findings, uh, which will ultimately uh, lead to a better security state overall. So I would say that's one of the biggest things on my mind is how do we get people uh, motivated? You know, how do we get them to 
to actually take action and fix the issues that are out there. Yeah, and I uh, I actually, uh, I don't know if you've, some of the audience have probably seen some of the sessions I do called Bionic Uncensored, these glass board sessions. I'm using the glass board now. And I recently did one, you can check it out, called Why. And it's really like, you know, you're talking as an application security professional to development team and the the, the concept of why is, is more uh, applicable to why would somebody do that? You know, why would somebody put that character string into the query string? Why would somebody try and, you know, uh, cause the, the application to crash with, uh, you know, an, a payload upload or something like that? So it's, it's not just about... Uh, um, a functional bug that is very uh, kind of easy to understand in terms of a remediation, you always have to prove why. Why would somebody do that? Because they have unlimited time and resources when you only have a short window to actually introduce that new point release, full release, feature request, so on and so forth. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I would say so. And I think that's certainly one way to motivate people. I think a lot of people, you know, as they as they learn more, especially what the attackers can do, and, and mm -hmm. I find this to be a very... Um, effective method is, you know, to show somebody how their code specifically uh, might have a weakness that could be exploited, you know, and, and that demonstration, I think, can be very motivating. We were just talking about motivation and engagement. I think that's certainly one way to motivate people, you know, kind of open their eyes when it comes to, you know, that code that you wrote. You know, I, I know you're proud of it, uh, but it, here's how we could actually take advantage of it, you know, for for. Uh, 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 malicious purposes. Um, yeah. And there's other ways to motivate people as well. You know, um, sometimes extrinsic rewards, uh, uh, versus more intrinsic. I, th I would say, uh, demonstrating the finding like we were just talking about and, and exploitability is more intrinsic, right? It kind of motivates people from the inside. Oh, you know, now I'm more motivated to go fix that issue, but there's also extrinsic rewards too, like thinking about adding, requirements to performance reviews, you know, um, definition of done, you know, you're not done with the issue uh, the, or the feature that you just coded if it has any security findings, you know, that, that kind of yep. stuff can also motivate folks. And then healthy competition. Uh, <laughs> it, it, and I, and I, frankly, I think it's culture specific, right? You can't uh, maybe do hardcore competition between folks or teams, but I think, you know, some light uh, maturity scores, et cetera, across teams, just to kind of show how teams are doing can also be very motivating too, you know? So. Very good. No, that that's great information. And now it's your opportunity to really talk about, you know, what's bugging you today in our rant session. I got a lot of problems with you people. <laughs> now you're going to hear about it. Dustin, what takes you off today in the industry? Is it overuse of an acronym? Is it, you know, thinking a technology works in a way when it really doesn't? What, what kind of gets you all hot and bothered in the industry today? Yeah, I, so there's been a, a move toward more of a partnership approach when it comes to security, especially AppSec working closely with engineering teams. I think what, what takes me off is, is not everyone's gotten that message. And... <laughs> I uh, also think, uh, again, this is part of why I joined the industry, because uh, what I've seen is a lot of folks back then and still um, taking kind of that ivory tower approach. You know, I'm, I'm going to sit here, I'm going to judge uh, how you're doing in terms of security. I'm going to tell you everything you did wrong. I'm not going to encourage you. I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to teach you. Right. And yep. I think we've we've evolved past that, I think, in general. And I, I think. I'd like to see a little more people, you know, catching up to where a lot of folks are today in terms of provide value, create that partnership, create that relationship with folks, be part of the team, you know, be in a position where people are inviting you in uh, early to do architecture reviews, you know, threat modeling activities, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, uh, because you've built that relationship and you've built that trust. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to see more people move toward that. No, I agree. And it's one of the uh, things that I always said is like, you know, as security, it's not like you, you come in as the heavy or the the uh, the police force. It's more like expending the olive branch of peace to the development staff and saying, here, I'm I'm here to help you. I, I come bearing gifts. You know, I'm not I'm not here to, you know, everyone kind of cringes where they hear security or somebody from security is going to come in and they're all like ready to fight. Let's, you know, we're all in this to create functioning software that is secure. And, you know, contention really derails that objective of creating functional software that is secure. Certainly. Yeah. I think it's, it's productive, though, to, to not come in 
and agree on everything at once either. Right? Oh, agree. Like, yeah. 100%. To have the push and pull from both sides, I, I think it's just a really healthy conversation. You know, engineering teams know things. Uh, the engineers know things that you don't know on the security side. You can't know all the details that they do, but yep. you know things from a security perspective. So it's really that uh, combined force uh, that that is most valuable. I think. Gotcha. So, no, that's great. Now we're going to flip the tables and give you an opportunity to wave your magic wand with the Nirvana World section. So Nirvana World is, you know, you have a magic wand, you, uh, you're Harry Potter or you're, I don't know, whatever else magical creature you are. If you could fix anything in the industry, what would it be? If you, it doesn't have to be like the relationship between development and AppSec. I mean, it could be anything you want. The sky's the limit in terms of the desire. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think providing more clarity to the engineering teams, um, the, the kind of the Nirvana concept that I have in my mind is, um, you know, could, could you provide like a single list of findings to your engineering organization that mm -hmm. combines everything you know on the security side into like one packaged deliverable? Right. So instead of, hey, here's a list of findings from this tool and here's another list and the other security team is going to send you something else for you to look at. Um, putting all those pieces together and automating reports that, you know, make it very clear to the engineering team. Here's the list. There's 10 findings. They're ordered by, you know, uh, severity. Uh, severity is calculated with context. You know, mm -hmm. where it's not just the, the basic CVSS score from the tool. It takes into account whether it's public facing or, uh, uh, you know, what, you know, the business criticality is, the, the data classification, right? All of that in one picture in this nice ordered prioritized list. Mm -hmm. And then the engineering teams, all they need to do, knowing all of that is prioritize it, you know, uh, and get it into their sprints so they can actually work it. Um, I just see a lot of disorganization out there today, and I think I think we can do better as a security team to automate that. But imagine all the pieces that have to come together to make that happen, right? You need an asset inventory that works uh, well. To, to give you an idea of the full picture, you need to identify ownership. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces there, and I, I think, uh, you know, once we figure that out, to me, that's, that's nirvana. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the other piece of nirvana that I would want to share is, you know, imagine the day where your engineers care about security, you know, and they're as part of their daily habits, thinking about security, fixing issues. Uh, you know, that's kind of the perfect harmony of, of security and engineering. Um, I think we can get there. I think it's gonna be challenging. You know, I think there's a lot in terms of education and stuff, you know, that there's gaps there. Uh, like my education was, hey, there's one optional security class that you can take. You know, it's not built into the, the you know, kind of the, the blood of, of a lot of um, uh, educational criteria these days. And I, I would certainly like to see that addressed as well. Oh, very good. Yeah, you know, those are you know great points uh, across the board to kind of address a problem that has existed for years and how to actually uh, you know take an approach to it. So appreciate that. We're going to move into the speed round now. He's going the distance. Uh, he's going for speed. All right. So the speed round, quick, quick questions. Uh, it can be a longer response or uh, based on kind of it. It could be a yes or no answer. It's up to you. But. What's your take as an application security uh, professional around the use of the term agile? Everybody uses agile. Every marketing material, white paper, agile, agile, agile DevOps, we're very agile. What's your take on the, the proper usage of the term agile? Yeah, I, I, I do think it's kind of a overused, bloated term at this point. Uh, <laughs> they use interchangeably with maybe some other words as well that they should be using. But uh, I, I think, especially as a software engineer and an architect, the the agile piece to me is you know still very relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's figuring out how to build systems you know that are resilient, that are agile, that can be updated quickly, uh, and, and it's also an approach to the process that 
I still think is very relevant. And that's, you know, you can't know everything you need to build up front. So you need to iterate, yep. you know, and, and to create a process and, 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 you know, systems that are agile to me is building that flexibility, you know, to be able to update them quickly if you need to, and uh, to even change your process if you need to. Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. So the next one's I'm very passionate and interesting from your take as a practitioner in application security, the concept of shift left. Everyone's used it. We've been using it for years. We're in a different process than a waterfall development. Uh, what's your take on shift left? Is it still a thing? Is it shift everywhere? What, what do you take as you talk to development teams about shift left? Yeah, I mean, I think I think shift left was a term that we needed at the time, right? Because mm -hmm. there was a lot of focus on the right side of the SDLC. So shift left, right, is, is kind of shifting into focusing a little bit more on uh, earlier SDLC best practices. Um, I think we needed that. I think we needed to to say, hey, you know what, if we want to prevent issues in production and and um, uh, ultimately reduce our time to fixing issues, we need to catch them sooner. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we needed it at the time, but I also think it's, I think we're past it. Um, and I think the way that I really like to define AppSec in, in a short version, if people are like, what, what is AppSec? What do you even do? Mm -hmm. um, I like to say that AppSec is building security into the SDLC. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a, you know, it's, it's beyond shift left. It's actually having those good habits in every, every um, stage. And, uh, you know, I don't know what we should call that, uh, you know, full uh, shift full, shift complete. I like to say shift everywhere. Shift everywhere. Shift That's, everywhere. I've shift. heard that too. Yeah. yeah shift, shift everywhere is what the, what I like to use because, yeah. you know, I look at it as the entity that you're developing changes as it moves through that DevOps process. And so it's like you need, you know, runtime information, you need build information, you need code information, all that tied together really gives you that complete landscape of risk. Yeah. Now walking in the door um, a, a couple times here, the other term I would want to throw out there um, that I kind of made up is is to start right, okay. And and the way that I like to talk about this is, uh, it's pro it's not the best idea to start with leftmost SDLC elements uh, because you you don't know how it's going to affect everything downstream. So I actually like to put uh, controls and and scans and and tests in place more on the right side of the SDLC, SDLC to start which really helps you create a baseline as well. Mm -hmm. Like how many issues are reaching production? Like how, yep. you know, what is our opportunity to improve? And then as you start adding elements to the left side, you can see how those right side results are affected. Oh, it makes sense. I like to, you know, shift everywhere. And I like to say remediate left, you know, remediation is done on the left and really identification is done everywhere. So it's shift everywhere for identification. Remediation is shift left. Because that's you know the beginning of the process, the people writing the code. Absolutely, it's the cheapest to fix on the left. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So another question and theory I have is you know application security. Do you think as an industry we're selling ourselves short that it should be software security? Because what is the definition of an app? Is an app like you know a calculator app on your phone? But you're talking about big complex systems for healthcare and e-commerce and you know co you know I like to say you know uh, uh, code is everywhere. I mean everything is code. So do you think application security is selling the, the industry as a whole short, or do you like the term? I actually do. I prefer software security. So I'm- I, I do as well. I, I do as well. Yeah, but I also like the short term <laughs> of AppSec yeah. versus SoftSec. Yeah. Like, to me, that doesn't really have the same punch. So Yeah, the, the, the terms are always about having a cool acronym associated with yeah, them. Yeah, and I think AppSec's <laughs> kind of cool, so- I don't know that that's going away anytime soon. Now I'm very conflicted. I, I do agree with you. I like software security because it's bigger, but I hate the acronym. So we got we got to work on that. Yeah. Last question. You know, you do a lot of things. I've seen a lot of your uh, information on LinkedIn, and you're touching on who do you look up to in the industry? Because I'm all about educating people on on different paths or different people that are saying interesting things. Who do you think is a, a good uh, kind of speaker and uh, person to follow in the industry of application security or cybersecurity as a whole, for that matter? Yeah, I have I have some thoughts here. Um, Besides Krebs, of course, that everybody checks in daily with, I'm sure. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, I, I think Chris Romeo is doing a lot of great stuff uh, with his podcast, App Application Security Podcast. Uh, a lot of new, fresh ideas, especially focused on culture and security champions and, and that sort of stuff. Um, 
there's a lot of stuff that I actually like to attend locally. There's a group Colorado Equal Security um, that's that I think is doing great things in terms of building community around security, you know, dinners and events and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I actually got way deep into what we call motivational design or gamification, mm-hmm. because uh, if we're going to talk about engagement and how to motivate people and, and how to get them excited about security, um, there's a there's a specific individual that I do follow. His name is Yu Kai Chow. Uh, he built a framework called o- Octalysis, and uh, I've just learned a ton when it comes to motivational design and psychology and all that stuff. And I think, you know, it's just a great compliment to what we do as, as security folks. That's great. Those are some new names for the audience that have listened to the podcast before. You know, we've had some repeat people, people follow, but those are new names. So that's great. So I'm all about educating people on a, a new path for uh, learning new things from new people. So thank you for that. Well, that, that's the section for uh, the speed round. Now it's my turn to ask you a couple questions and we're going to go to the expert witness section. Your Honor, I move to disqualify Ms. Beto as an expert witness. Can you answer the question? No, it is a trick question. So Dustin, I have a concept, like I, I had a conversation this week uh, with somebody at RSA and it's a very high level executive. Like I want to fix everything. I want my apps to be 100% secure. And I said, there's no such thing as a 100% secure application. There's always risk in the application. And it's just based on what risk you're willing to ex- uh, accept. And there's two variables I always like to throw out there, impact and likelihood. How bad is it and how likely is it to happen? What's your take when you know your executive staff says, I want my applications to be 100% secure? Well, first of all, if, if a non-security person asked something like that, I would be very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a major step forward. Wow, cool. You care about security. Fantastic. Let's talk. Yeah. Um, but I'd I also think, like a flying car. You know, I'd yeah, like a exactly. flying car. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I don't think, I think 100% secure, first of all, is, is unattainable. I think we all know that uh, attackers are always coming up with new techniques, et cetera. They're creative. We're creative. It's always this kind of push-pull. Uh, but I also think you definitely need to take into account the the risk level and and sort of the business value versus security, right? And, mm-hmm. and try to find the middle ground there, um, because you know perfect security would be unplug your computer and don't do anything <laughs> at all, you know. Yeah. And, and one other way that it was described to me that that I just have carried forward with with uh, with me when I talk about this is without a business there would be nothing to secure. Right. So focus on making your business succeed first and match that level of success and and risk with uh, with security. Oh, it makes total sense. Makes total sense. Another question I have for you, Dustin, is, you know, this is something I'm passionate and where my career path has gone after 17 years in uh, SaaS scanning the source code is the concept of application security posture management or ASPM, which is a cool acronym, I think. Um, Have you heard of it? Do you know anything about it? Uh, Is it come across your radar just yet? Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly seeing a lot of tools popping up, especially recently, and actually spent a significant of time, amount of time uh, evaluating a handful of them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, certainly I've heard of them. I, I think their focus is really on creating that one complete picture, uh, kind of what I was alluding to before for the security. That's where I was going team. with it. Yep, yep. Yeah, but also yeah. potentially for the engineering work as well to understand, um, you know, all of the findings across the environment in context, you know, uh, and and helping to merge the results from various tools and and just kind of be that central dashboard and central reporting mechanism and and go to, uh, uh, to get an understanding of of your security maturity. Yeah. And the way I look at it is a lot of the star AST scanning solutions out there are all looking at one specific slice of the perpetual pizza that is an application. You know, you're looking at the source code or the running application or the software, the open source packages or the APIs. It's about how do you put context around how all those work in unison, not just looking at it from one slice, but does that slice, you know, have a blast radius that could basically cause issues with other areas that you're not even looking at? Yep, certainly. Yeah, I think that's, that's some of the context that I'm talking about before. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, like I was saying before, pub, if it's public facing, the business criticality, right, the ability to <clears throat> just go beyond the basics of the findings mm-hmm. and, um, 
even relate findings to uh, specific um, applications or microservices or services, you know, whatever you have in your environment. Um, I think that's really important too. And then uh, ownership is just another big piece that I, I would like to see more tools focus on in general. You know, I, I've seen a lot of tools that are, uh, you know, they allow you to create, you know, set up a team and, and assign folks manually to the applications that are out there and the repos that are out there. But I think a lot of that can be detected automatically. And I, I think there's room for maturity there and, and ev evolution to detect that stuff automatically, right? Using HR okay. systems, using like the last committer for GitHub, you know, and just kind of putting all the pieces together. No, great. And the final question you mentioned before, and it's something I, I, I am very passionate about, but it's a very complicated thing, I think, to do in in modern software development life cycles or, you know, DevOps programs is threat modeling. How do you see threat modeling as, it's very important, but how does it work in a in a modern CI CD process where people are listening, releasing 10 hundreds of times, that threat model gets old very fast. How do you update that? And how would you approach that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest benefits, especially when you start your threat modeling journey is to, like we were talking about before, combine the knowledge of your engineering org and your security team through those threat modeling exercises. You know, think think the old school with the whiteboard, you talk about the systems, security team learns a lot about the systems, the development team learns a lot from security in terms of the stuff that they're thinking about. Um, it's a good first step. It's, it's, you know, it's a good way to kind of get people into it and, and train them, but you're exactly right. How do you scale something like that? Do you have the resources mm -hmm. on the security team, et cetera, to do those activities across the entire engineering org all the time? No. And I think there's an opportunity to shift a lot of that to toward automation and also toward uh, uh, engineering ownership of it, right? Having them be responsible for updating their data flow diagrams and the architecture diagrams and, and all of that, maybe based on the precedent that you set during those activities. But they're carrying it forward, and security team would be providing the the tools, et cetera, to help them with that. Um, I've heard of a lot of great things, you know, that are being created and that are popping up in terms of automating threat models and that kind of stuff. And <laughs> I definitely think that's the future. Oh, awesome! And I agree with you 100. percent Well, that's the expert witness session. Thank you for you know great feedback on all the different areas. And again, we had some new questions, uh, so we're kind of going to mix it up with some questions here as we move forward with the podcast. The next section before the final section is uh, I like to call the social section, the section on tattoos. Now he's getting a tattoo. Yeah, he's getting ink done. He asked for a 13, but they drew a 31. So I was at RSA this past week. I know I'll probably date the podcast by saying that, but we're going to go with it. And a lot of people, I do the podcast and the Bionic Uncensored and people see my posts and they say, I want to see the guy with the tattoos. I want to talk to him. What's your take in the industry about people expressing themselves with, you know, maybe non-standard business uh, look or presence. Uh, I see a lot of people out there and, and it seems like tattoos and cybersecurity is pretty much like uh, as mandatory as uh, getting swag in a backpack at a conference. So what's your take in terms of your day-to-day uh, -day interaction with development teams, security teams, so on and so forth? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> probably where I'd start is that I also have a tattoo myself. So, you know, I'm down. I'm down with it. <laughs> and, good, uh, good, good. I think in general, um, People should be allowed to express themselves. I, th I think we need to focus more on the value that they're bringing, the skills that they have, uh, et cetera. I mean, you could probably say the same thing for work from home. Yep. You know, I don't want to necessarily go off on that on that tangent right now. But, um, uh, you know, how are people most pro productive and, and what yep. do they need to do for themselves personally to um, to be productive? You know, and I think that varies across the board. And I don't think you can create a, a template and just try to fit everybody into it. Uh, I think everybody's unique and, and they're going to have different ways of expressing themselves. And I think that's uh, completely fine and, and should be encouraged, frankly. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. And I'm glad, you know, sometimes I, I don't ask about the tattoos up front and some people are like, well, I don't have any, but I really want one. And some people are like, I have, you know, I'm covered. So it's just a, kind of the social aspect. So we're not just talking AppSec all the time. 
So our last section is closing. This is your chance to, you know, plug something you're interesting. If you're writing a book, if your organization you're interested in, even a charity, you know, something that Dustin's passionate about that you want to share with the audience and gain more kind of exposure for that uh, specific topic. It can be technical, it can be personal, it can be whatever you want. It's your soapbox to to plug whatever you'd like. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity, Matt. Um, so I actually run a meetup group uh, and we meet every month. It's called Let's Talk Software Security. And uh, one of the reasons I created it is because, you know, there's a lot of presentations out there and presentations are cool. Speakers are cool. That's great. But uh, what I thought was missing is a format of, hey, let's just get together and talk. Let's just have a discussion. Let's set a topic and talk about it. You know, show up, share your thoughts, ask some questions, you know interact right that that's kind of the whole point of of the meetup um so we meet every month uh it's it's a whole lot of fun we have great turnout we have a lot of the industry ex experts showing up regularly um it's just a lot of fun so um if that's your cup of tea uh we'd love to see you at some point well where is it located uh well you know it's actually, uh, is it yeah thanks thanks for prompting me on that uh it's actually on it, it's a global group so mm -hmm. it's not a local in-person meetup. Um, it's all remote. It's all video call. Uh, and we get folks uh, all over the world that join. And I did notice that you call it software security and not application security. Exactly. Yeah, you, you call it, let's call it software. So there we go. It's life imitating art there. We, we did a little foreshadowing totally by accident. <laughs> We're starting a trend. Let's do this. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dustin, that's the wrap on the podcast today. I really appreciate your time and taking the, you know, a little bit of a time out of your busy schedule to chat with us. Uh, really appreciate it, and uh, hope we enjoyed the uh, the conversation. Yeah, thanks a lot, Matt, for having me. This was great. Dustin, thanks for being on the show today. Really liked the uh, conversation and the format. You provide a lot of great information. Tattoos, code, and data flows. Please like, subscribe, listen to it on your you know favorite podcast platform. <laughs>